the fairy tale castle, Germany's Neuschwanstein. I really don't like it, and I'd like to tell you why. All right, so now, as I mentioned, uh, Germany's fairy tale castle of Neuschwanstein has about 7 million annual visitors and more postcards than even the most dedicated grandma could ever get through. And yeah, I'm just, I'm really not a, a big fan of it for a variety of reasons, but I'm not here to just complain. I can do that on my own time and we often do. Instead, what I wanna do is go through four major reasons why I don't like it. And if you were to agree with me on any of those points, I wanna give you some recommendations about places where as someone who's been living here for a while, someone who's been going out there and doing a lot of trips, where would I recommend you go if you value the same things as I do? And one quick disclaimer, just to be clear, I am not trying to yuck anybody's yums. If you've enjoyed Neuschwanstein, if you have fond memories there, I'm not taking that away from you at all. I just want to be a little bit more critical and offer constructive criticisms and recommendations a little bit more than what your average vlogger might be trying to do since we are locals after all. But this is not an attack on Neuschwanstein. Well, it's a little bit of an attack on Neuschwanstein, but it's not an attack on anybody who likes it and I'm not taking it away from you. So with enough hedging, let's jump into our first criticism, which of course, at least for me, is I don't find the story very compelling. The history of Neuschwanstein is quite boring and maybe we're nerds, but when we go to castles, specifically castle ruins a lot of the time, I want it to illuminate my understanding. Why was this built? Why was it put here? How did they do it? All of that stuff. I really want to understand. And the story of Neuschwanstein couldn't be further from that if it tried. Essentially, King Ludwig II, and I apologize if you already know this, uh, you know, he decided he wanted to build a magical fairy castle. It was in the 1800s, and the first skyscraper had already been commissioned, and he thought it would be cool if he spent some of his immense wealth on a vanity project on a castle of an imagined and idealized medieval past that he was never really a part of, obviously. And he spent so much money on it and was planning on building another one that he ended up getting stabbed in the back after having only lived in the castle for a couple months. So he didn't even finish moving into it. And the moment that that happened, it well, it's been a tourist trap ever since. And I don't know, of all the castles we've ever been to, I find that story really boring. And if I can be really honest with you, I don't know how anybody looks at it and doesn't see anything other than the Trump Taj Mahal. You get these immensely wealthy people siphoning money into meaningless vanity projects. And I don't know, I guess all castles are a little bit like that, but this castle is only like that. And I just don't like it myself. But anyway, enough rambling about that. What would we recommend you do instead? What's a castle that taught us something? Yeah, so one of our favorite places we've ever gone to was Ruta in Tirol, World of Castles. It was our, I think, almost our first video that we ever, we ever <laughs> did. So if you watch it, please be kind. The editing so is not that good. <laughs> Basically, this system of castles yeah. overlooks the Via Claudia Augusta, which is this big road that was big back in the day that goes from Venice into Central Europe. And so it was the main trading route, right? I knew that back in the day, Venice was like this big central trading hub in the Mediterranean, but I never thought about how it affected the rest of Central Europe. And it did. They traded with the rest of Europe via this road. It didn't go over the mountains. It went through the valleys. And when you go to the world of castles, you'll see how important this was. I think it was the Tyrolians, I'm pretty sure. The Tyrolians who originally built a castle on one side, a fortress on that same side but higher up another fortress on the other side of the valley and it's all connected today by a modern world's longest pedestrian suspension bridge yep. and when you're there at the site it's really cool because you can visualize how important it was to control these valleys that led into Europe because it was the only way through the Alps right so the Tyrolians uh, there's also a gate I forgot to mention that <laughs> yeah, that's where they uh, collected taxes also closed the gate if they needed to defend the valley right from people they didn't want coming up mm -hmm. into Central Europe so when you go to that site you can really visualize this very specific history. So we went there, did that, and I really feel like I know a lot more about medieval history right. and how things are developed and how they affect today. Yeah, definitely. It was it was so much fun. Oh, and I think you forgot to mention they were also built in different time periods, right? Because mm -hmm. it's castles and later fortresses. Yeah. You know, some cared about cannons, some didn't. Yeah, so it illustrates the different methods that they would use to defend themselves exactly. throughout the ages, which is really, really cool. Yeah, adds an extra meta layer, not only the why, but then you get into the how. And that actually brings us quite nicely onto point two. And you guys really aren't gonna like me for this one. If you didn't like that, the first one, you're not gonna like the second one, which is 
I think the exterior is really ugly. Um, you know, form did not follow function or in any, yeah, they didn't care about function at all. It's just, it's madness. It's the, the way, it's the walls are so large and blank in many places without much adornment. And then you have the crazy Rapunzel towers and I guess there's a lovely balcony, but everybody's got a lovely balcony in the Alps. That's not impressive. And so, yeah, I find the whole exterior of it really gaudy. I mean, like any good tourist, they'll tell you that this castle inspired Disney Cinderella's castle. I don't know, maybe, maybe you really aren't gonna like this part. I think that castle's gaudy as well. It's just, nah, not, it's not for me. It's not my bag. Yeah, big <laughs> McMansion vibes. Yeah, it does feel like the 1800s Castle McMansion. Yeah. Uh, and I don't like those either. So all in all, it's just not a site that I find particularly appealing. So with a bad story and without particularly good visuals, Ah, there's not a lot for me already. I'm already disliking it. So where should you go if the exterior optics, that's what you value? Okay, this recommendation is a little basic. Not as basic as Neuschwanstein. <laughs> what could be? Still kind of basic though. And that is Salzburg. And that is because it's sort of a three in one as far as beauty goes. Yep. Okay, so we have naturally, we have a beautiful castle that's looking over the town of Salzburg. So it looks really beautiful from below in the town. And there are also gorgeous views from up in the castle yep. in Salzburg. Um, there's also a beer garden, there's a museum, you can walk around. It's very, very engaging. So I'd say it's sort of the cooler, prettier, yeah. more interactive version of Neuschwanstein. If you're not into castles at all, you can go into the town. It's mm -hmm. very aesthetic, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if that's just not enough for you, there's also the Mirabel Palace, which if you are a fan of The Sound of Music, you'll know that some of the uh, scenes from The Sound of Music were filmed in that palace. Mm -hmm. Super beautiful. That's sort of if you're into the opulence of Neuschwanstein, you can get that at the palace in Salzburg. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you put all those things together and what more could you ask for? Which neatly brings us to our third option. So we don't like how it looks on the outside, but no worries, it's a big castle. Let's go inside and it's just as disappointing, if not more. So as I mentioned with the story, King Ludwig II, he was murdered, allegedly. There's a big mystery around his death. and uh, But regardless, what we do know is when he did die. And it was after having only lived in that castle for a small period of time, meaning he hadn't finished furnishing the place. And then when you finally get into the place, there's nothing really to look at. So. Uh, I don't know. I've never heard of anyone going to Neuschwanstein and saying that they're glad that they took the tour, that it was a requirement that when you go, you need to do it too. I've never heard that. And so if you have thought that, leave it in the comments. You'll be the first person I'll have ever met. Instead, what I hear is a little bit of Stockholm syndrome, a little bit of sunk time, sunk cost fallacy, where everyone goes, oh, it was nice. Yeah, the balcony was great, which again, I'm not giving you points for a balcony in the Alps, like it's so easy. And so if, if people who like Neuschwanstein are recommending that you might need to skip it, people who don't like it, ah, you can really skip it. So if you're in the mood for interiors, we have two awesome suggestions that kind of, well, they're a bit different, aren't they? If you are looking for the Ludwigs Vi opulence, then I would recommend Herden Kimsey. Mm -hmm. Basically, Ludwig II was like, I'm gonna build a palace that looks like Versailles on a island in a lake in Bavaria. It's quite beautiful, <laughs> the lake and the island and the palace. That's so much going on. So if on. you're looking for that opulence, I would say this this is much like a Neuschwanstein, but better. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean like, I guess I'd be lying if I would say it's not tacky because, you know, I, I think, kind of think all palaces from that time are tacky, but it's yeah. like in line with the type of things they were making. Plus it's much more interactive, right? You have to take a yeah. boat to the island. It's just very cool. And there aren't a lot of international tourists. So you get to feel like, you know, you're doing something a little bit off. It the is shockingly path. off the international tourist path. I've only ever seen Germans there and it's not really even that crowded. Yeah. A lot of people like from the region go there a lot. Right. Would recommend, we don't have a video on it yet, uh, we're gonna do that hopefully this summer, 2022. Yeah. Hopefully the corona stuff doesn't get any, get get even worse. Yeah, you can imagine why we haven't done it yet. Yeah, um, this is, and then our second recommendation is a little bit more on like the bias side, something we like, but it- <laughs> We're shoehorning it in because we love it. <laughs> but it does involve sort of like castle opulence, but it's medieval opulence. So outside of Bolzano, there is a castle, the illustrated castle, uh, Castle Roncolo, and it has the oldest secular frescoes in Europe. So basically it's this castle that is just coated. It's like three, three floors, I think, of yeah. these secular frescoes. And they're very, very well preserved, super bright. Uh, the color stayed really well. And if you like kind of like 
goofy ass medieval art like I do, find it very meme and funny, then you'll love this. It's educational and funny. Oh my God. I mean, they, they couldn't draw a lion to save their life, could they? And what is really cool is, like you said, because it's all about secular life, and we're not making a judgment call, and we say this in the video if you watch it, it's not a judgment call about religious versus secular, but what it is is very different than what you'd usually see. And it's all about kind of the life of the aristocracy and them going on joust and stuff like that. So it's very different than the kind of frescoes that you'd usually see in Italy. And so that brings us to our fourth and final complaint. If you've stuck around this long, I really appreciate it. If you've been mean to me in the comments, I definitely don't. But number four, there's no good hiking. You know that obviously I love a good hike and yeah, there are good hikes in that area of the Alps, but specifically the walk and hike to Neuschwanstein that most people take is along a road, which is pretty boring. And if you do go off of the road, as many people do towards Marienbrücke for that kind of famous shot that everyone takes, it's really quite clogged. And I'm not a hermit. I don't need to be alone in the woods, but I do like a little bit of peace and quiet. And this place is just so busy. I just don't feel like you can properly stretch your legs while you're trying to hike around it. It's fine, but compared to all the other hikes in the area, especially some very close by hikes, it's just not that good to me. It feels like too much of a compromise. So if you're looking to hike in that area and still see Neuschwanstein, where should you go? So about 20 minutes down the road in the same valley, there is a hike to two castle ruins, <laughs> Eisenberg and Hohenfreiberg, but it's the same sort of elevation gain. Yeah. So it's pretty easy, not too difficult. Most people who are going to Germany and don't aren't super into hiking could, could do this, but still yeah. get more out of what the Alps has to offer. So it's in the same valley. You can even see Neuschwanstein, Hohenschwangau across the valley from, from this hike. You can also see another castle ruin that we featured in another video, Falkenstein Castle. Yeah, it was almost, it is. yeah, it was almost Neuschwanstein 2.0, watch that video, but it's just a more engaging hike. So basically oh, so it's one train stop up from the Neuschwanstein station of Füssen and you get off and you hike through this tiny little village, go up through a cow field. So you have these like beautiful cow bells yeah. ringing in the distance as you look over this like beautiful field with the mountains in the background. Mm -hmm. And you just sort of make your way up and across to two different really big uh, castle ruins. Yeah. They're huge. Yeah, they really are. Um, decently intact. You can still see sort of the ruins. It's not just like a single wall that's leaning over like kind of dangerously like a lot of the uh, castles we get right, to. Right, or covered over rubble. Like it is a proper good ruin yeah. with, with room section. Yeah, just in general, it's the same sort of elevation gain. It's the same sort of... Um, yeah. Like it requires the same sort of stuff out of you. It's in the same area, but the views are just better, more engaging. We go back, uh, we've gone back quite a few times. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. And like you said, 20 minutes down the road, so you've got no excuse for not doing it. More people should definitely check that out. Which I think does it for this video. Those are my four major complaints. I hope you view them as constructive criticisms to your itinerary, things that I think you could improve on if you value. But of course, like I said at the beginning, you can ignore it. I'm just a guy on the internet. If you feel differently, let me know. If you've been to Neuschwanstein, do you agree with my critiques? Do you think, uh, do you view it a bit differently? Is there a different perspective I'm missing? I would love to hear it. If you like this video, please check out the rest of our channel. We don't just have those few videos that are alternatives to Neuschwanstein. We have a lot of content on what to do in and around Bavaria. Um, I think they're really fun to watch. I hope you do too. Please like, comment, subscribe, and follow us on Instagram. See you next time. Bye.